recording. Welcome to Art 116. I'm James, and this is Friday afternoon, and something just showed up on my screen that I didn't want to. Okay. Um, so we did the uh, midterm quiz on Wednesday, and I haven't looked at them. I'm sorry. The thing, uh, that contraption kind of um, grades the quizzes automatically, and so you've already got a grade posted for your quiz, and so that was wonderful. Um, also, I haven't looked at any of the projects that were due Wednesday night, so I'll get I'll get caught up on that this weekend. Uh, but thank you for getting on that and uh, figuring that stuff out, because that's great. Um, what I really want to do, because today is uh, Friday, uh, in the beginning of a three-day weekend, because we've got President's Day as a national holiday on Monday, so we don't have any school on Monday, we won't be meeting again until next Wednesday. And I just can't have you sitting idly by and not having anything to do until next Wednesday. So I wanted to plunge headlong into a discussion of the next project, present it to you with about three or four slides from a PowerPoint presentation, and then do a little bit of a demonstration to kind of show you what and where I want you to go. And then to tell you that I have some, not a worksheet, but a template uh, available um, on my little table that's out here at the west entrance to uh, Eden Hall. Um, you know, the table that we communicate with, the table that I put all my junk on that you come over and you pick up junk off of. So that will be there. And I can send it out too. Um, so that if you are far away, or if it's something that you can actually print out on your computer at home, if you have a printer, that would be great. But we'll cross that bridge once you see what this project is all about. So welcome to the party. Got to make sure Ezra has is checked in here. All right. Welcome. So let's, without any further ado, if you haven't been able to take either the midterm quiz or turn in your um, triad project, I will reopen that for you. So when I go through all that stuff in the next, I don't know, five hours or so, if I see that anybody has not been able to complete those two things recently. I will reopen those so that you can get those done because it's really important for me that you can actually get things done and stay caught up in the class. So um, we will do that. Let me do a screen share and uh, start us off on a little demonstration presentation on what I'm talking about today. So is this it? Is this what I want to do? Sure it is. Why not? That'll work. Okay, I'm going to go here. Okay, and start the thing right here. Okay, yay. So here we go. Got to tuck you guys up into the corner. We just got done with triads. And triads were some wonderful way of um, being able to share, um, to share, to select three colors from the color wheel um, and have them kind of spaced out in a uniform and rational way on the color wheel so that they created a kind of a spaced out rational um, relationship to each other. Usually um, when we put these regular polygons over the top of the color wheel, it spaces things out enough so that we've got things that are, um, um, well, if I, if I draw a diagonal right here, if I draw a diagonal line through the color wheel right here, everything on the left side is gonna be a warm color. Everything on the right side is gonna be a cool color. If I draw a horizontal line right through the center of the color wheel, everything above that is gonna be high key. Everything below that is gonna be a low key color. So when we use these regular polygons over the top of the color wheel, we tend to get equally, equal numbers of things that are either warm or cool and equal numbers of things that are either high key or low key. And so you get a range, a variety of kind of equally spaced colors that can relate to each other in a composition. Today we're going to do tetrads, and tetrads can be determined one of two ways. Tetra meaning four, so tetrads will be a four-color color scheme. And the standard way is to take a square 
and superimpose that over the color wheel and select the four colors that come at the four corners of the square. But you can also have a very fancy um, tetrad, which is a double split complement tetrad. So we've got a complementary color here of yellow green and red violet. And if we split to the adjacent colors on both of these color complements, we get yellow, green, red, and violet. And that could be a four color um, color complement, uh, a double split complement. So those are the two ways that you can choose four colors for your um, tetrad for this particular project. Um, something that I didn't talk about, but that was mentioned in your book was the idea of analogous colors. Analogous colors are ones that are adjacent to each other on the color wheel. And that's a, such a simple way of uh, kind of coming up with a color scheme that I didn't want to do a project on it. I didn't mention it. It was, it was asked about in the quiz. And, you know, if I have a lot of you guys um, overthrowing the government because, you know, it wasn't fair that I haven't talked about analogous colors before it was on the color wheel, I can maybe make some kind of an adjustment to your quiz. Uh, this would be an analogous color scheme here. The colors in this composition are like violet, red, violet, red. Uh, orange and yellow. So it's like all of the colors is over the warm half of the colors um, of the color wheel. They're all adjacent to each other. And so they would be a, a, um, an analogous color scheme. Um, but it is kind of interesting to, to go back to colors uh, and looking at them um, from the color wheel and looking at the warm colors from one side versus the cool colors um, on the other side, um, they kind of balance each other out for the most part. We have half of the warm colors are high key and half of the warm colors are low key, sort of, um, when compared to a value scale. And the same thing for the cool colors. Almost half you know, are warm, are, are, I'm sorry, are higher key and then half of them live in the low key range of the value scale. Um, the project I wanna do is kind of based on this painting by Paul Cezanne. Um, this part of, the, um, of what the chapter is talking about is gonna be talking about plastic color. And Cezanne is a post-impressionist in the 1880s, kind of marked out his territory in terms of innovation and art history because he became someone who thought that colors um, could hold the day in a color composition and that plastic colors could show three-dimensionality of color without the use of white or black mixed in. For 500 years before Cezanne, the traditional way of painting was to mix in a little bit of white to create higher key colors and white highlights on um, surfaces of things like fruit or glass or ceramics or something like that. And the other um, part of that was to mix black in to create black shadows in areas of the composition so that you know the shaded portion of a solid object like an apple um, would have a crescent shaped um, uh, shadow on it. And then it would have a cast shadow going behind the fruit and that was also, you know, colors mixed with black. And what Cezanne did, this is not the greatest example because it's from an earlier part of his career, but his brush strokes are very chunky. Um, he's working wet in wet um, with color, but his brush strokes did tend to create this idea of plastic color so that his bright high key colors became the things that advanced towards the viewer and created a, the illusion of plastic shapes in a plastic space created by plastic color. Then plastic means three-dimensional in this idea. So his, the, the fronts of his apples, the part of the apple that's closest to us looks like it is advancing towards you because it is bright, it is high key, and it's warm. The crescent portion of each apple that is in a shadow looks like it is receding away from you because it is somewhat neutralized 
and the colors are just a little bit cooler and or neutral. And of course, the shadows are even more neutral. And if he wasn't using quite so much what appears to be black here, then this would be the, you know, an ex excellent example of his um, idea of plastic color, creating uh, plastic shapes in a plastic space. Um, so we're going to, you know, we, we've talked about warm and cool color. Color temperature is another way to organize color schemes. So the warm colors, I guess this was another thing that I hadn't got, gotten to yet by the time the midterm rolled around. Warm colors or red, orange, and yellow are considered warm because they're associated with the sun or fire. And cool colors, green, blue, and violet, are cool because they're associated with sky, plants, water, so forth. So um, we have warm and cool colors as a concept in the color wheel, another way to categorize colors, separating them into different kinds of categories that act in different ways in compositions. Um, now I'm gonna bring in one more post-impressionist painter at this point, Georges Seurat, um, who was a pointillist because we're actually going to play a little bit with pointillism technique today, or this week, I should say. So this is a painting by Surratt, and you know it's the bathers bathing at Asniers, is a beach on the Seine River in Paris. And we've got the uh, industrial Paris in the background with the smokestacks and everything. We've got people in swimsuits enjoying a sunny Sunday, Sunday in the water and people hanging out and just relaxing in the grass. So what's really interesting about this pointillism technique is that he's painting with little pure dots of color, um, just putting down dots, not even brush strokes on the canvas, but just little dots. So in an area of blue water, like this area right in front of the knee of the person sitting on the bank, we have blue, but if you look at it on really, really close inspection, it's only about 70 or 80% blue here with a smattering of other dots in there that kind of helps break it up and kind of helps to oh, create an illusion that there are, uh, there's light bouncing around in here and light is uh, reflecting off the water. So there's orange in this swimsuit and orange in this hat over here and orange in this hat over here. And there's about 5% of orange dots smattered into this area of blue here. There's green in this grass over here. And there's just a little bit of green, again, interspersed in the dots in this blue water right here. So there's nothing that's a solid color in this composition. If we go to the orange um, swimsuit here, it is 70 or 80% orange dots but there is a smattering of some green and some blue and some yellow, you know, interspersed in these dots to break it up a little bit, give it a little bit of texture, make it just a little bit more interesting and force your eye to do optical color mixing to make a much more complex kind of an orange here than if it was just a solid color of orange. It's the same thing with the green, you know, 80, 90% green, with a smattering and an interspersion of other dots, some brown, some orange, the occasional blue, to break this up so that it's not all just one color. We can see that the warm colors tend to advance towards the viewer in the composition. The cool colors tend to recede away from the viewer in the composition. And neutralized colors, colors that are grayed out and very much neutralized in this case by being, by, mi by being mixed with either white or gray kinds of paint really seem to recede into the background. And so the everything that's way out on the horizon that's in the far distance is a grayed out form of the color. It's a very neutralized form of the color, usually by having lots of white mixed in with it so that it becomes a neutralized version of that color. Okay, so we're gonna take everything we learned from this painting and move forward, hopefully, into plastic colors. So colors, you know, hopefully may be organized by their ability to create depth in a composition and the illusion of three-dimensional space. So 
In general, these are our huge generalities here. In general, warm colors advance towards the viewer and cool colors tend to recede away from the viewer. That's item one. But there's another piece of it too. Bright colors, full spectrum intensity colors will also advance towards the viewer. Even cool colors, if they're uh, very bright colors at full spectrum intensity will tend to pop forward in the compositional space while neutralized or grayed out colors will tend to recede in the compositional space. And this tension, this push pull of color can actually create the illusion of three-dimensional space in a, on a two-dimensional surface. And that is what we are going to explore in this project. So we're gonna come back to Paul Cezanne's apples. I'm gonna ask you guys to repaint this uh, still life with apples here. And we're going to do it um, using pointillism. We're going to do it using Seurat's pointillism. And, but the, we're going to do an homage to Cezanne. We're going to try to uh, choose four colors off the color wheel to create um, our color tetrad. And then we're going to try to recreate this just using dots and putting dots of pure color on the composition and not doing any kind of color blending or anything like that, but just having the optical color blending of a, tiny dots adjacent to each other um, do the work for us. Just like you're experiencing right now on your computer monitor. Um, cathode ray tubes, television, computer monitors are all on the concept of like individual pixels, you know, 1000 by, you know, 600 pic pixels is the image that you're looking at. And so, you know, it's a whole bunch of little tiny dots of color that are adjacent to each other to create the effect on the screen. Well, we're going to try to do that the old fashioned way, the way that Surratt did it with, um, with dots of color. And I think I'm done here. So I'm going to come back to you guys and stop the screen share and move my stuff out of the way so that now I'm going to switch to a demonstration. So going to the bird's eye camera view of my workspace and bringing in a whole bunch of stuff here, we're going to try to do some version of Cezanne's apples. So the first thing we have to do is use a color wheel and create a tetrad select you know four colors that were, could be the four colors in a tetrad. So basically you're gonna take your square and lay it on top of here to try to get your four colors. And at the four corners, right now I've got orange, yellow, green, blue, and red, violet. I could build you know, my um, Cezanne's apples out of those four colors. I could rotate this and I could go yellow, red, orange, violet, and blue-green, those could be my four colors. But I have to pick four colors using this method from the color wheel, and then I have to stick with those colors. I have to choose those colors and stick with them and not, <clears throat> not cheat and make this a five-color project. So the other way you can do this is with a double split complement tetrad, where you've got the complementary color pair, yellow and violet, but you're going to split off of both of those and take the four colors, two colors on each end that are adjacent. So this one would be yellow, orange, and yellow, green, and red, violet, and blue, violet. Or you can continue to rotate this thing. So I rotate it once, and I've got yellow, orange, violet, and blue. And those could be the four colors in my double split complement tetrad. I can rotate it again, and I can go yellow orange, red orange, blue violet, and blue green. And again, those could be my four colors, but you have to do this once, then write your colors down, and then stick to them and don't put in a fifth color because that's cheating. So that's how we select a tetrad for use in this project. Now I have printed out um, a two-page thing here. It is, pro it is the Project 6, and it describes the Tetrad. I printed it out, and I printed out a you know, full-color um, uh, reproduction of Cezanne's apples. And then I'm giving you guys um, this. 
which is on cardstock. It's printed out on cardstock. And it's, it's the painting that I have Photoshopped to create kind of um, uh, contour line drawing for you. And it gives you a smattering of an idea of the um, values in the composition. So we've got a little bit of the uh, shadows happening in the shadow areas, especially these um, crescent shaped shadows that are on the shaded side of each apple. We've also got Let's see, these are the stem ends of the apple where the stem goes in to a, an indentation in the apple and there's a cast shadow there. And you can kind of see either the stem end or the blossom end of each piece of the fruit. So that's a detail. So we've got the stem ends, we've got the highlights for each piece of fruit a little bit off to the left, and we've got the... Um, uh, the crescent shaped kind of uh, shadows on each piece of fruit. And though all of that information together makes three dimensional spherical apples. And then we've also got cast shadows into the background that give us, you know, a sense of an additional clue and sense about three dimensionality. So we're going to take this and we're going to start doing dots on this. And after about eight hours of painting on this, you will get reveal, dramatic reveal, um, you'll get your version of the Cezanne apples. It's a still life with apples. This is actually going to work and you will have a piece of artwork that will be suitable for framing. Um, there are picture frames across the street at Walmart that are only 10 bucks. And so this is one of the cheapest, easiest, dirtiest ways for you to get a really nice little painting that is you know, suitable for hanging in your home uh, or to give away to a loved one or something like that. But, you know, this is a really nice painting that would go in your kitchen because it is a still life of fruit or in your living room or bathroom or something like that. So you're going to get something out of this class that's actually a finished work of art that you could frame and hang in your house if you want to. And the way we do this is we have to make dots. And so I'm about to demonstrate that piece right now. In fact, I started this with the morning class and I may just continue this. In the morning class, I picked um, yellow orange, red orange, blue green, and blue violet, a double split complement as my uh, colors that I was gonna work with. And I started off with yellow orange here. And so I have to remake a yellow orange for you guys. If I can find my paints that I was working with this. There they are, working with this morning. Okay, so here we go. We're off to the races. I'm going to put a little bit of yellow on here. Not too much, because we're not going to do very much. And a little bit of orange to make a yellow orange. Okay, and I'm going to use my brush to mix these things together, because my color is yellow orange. It's not yellow. It's not orange. It's yellow orange. Okay, and so we've got that color. Hooray. And now I'm going to try to clean this off as much as possible. And I am not going to use the brush, at least the bristles on the brush. I'm going to turn the brush around and use the tail end of the brush. The little round tail end of the brush is what I'm using to make these dots. And so um, usually my highest key color is going to be um, a highlight kind of off center, uh, a little bit left of center in each apple. This is where I'm painting right now in the, in the painting. So I'm kind of looking at my photograph, my um, color printout, and I'm going to you know get a smattering of dots in there. Eventually, we're going to get a painting where all of the dots are so close together that there's no white uh, paper showing through at all. Um, but to begin with, we have to just get, you know, stuff established here. And it will take three or four hours just to cover this thing once with dots. And then once it's covered, then you're going to start putting your second layer of dots on where dots start to overlap other dots and start, you have to break up the dots sometimes with an interspersing of the of some of the other three colors that you have in your composition 
So this is not, even though this looks like it's going to be a solid color highlight, it's, you still might have like a little bit of your red or your violet or your green, you know, interspersed in there just to break it up just a little bit. Um, as we play with the idea of what Cezanne did, but really what also um, Surratt did with the um, pointillism, you can kind of see that optical color mixing is going to kind of take over here when we get going with this. So I've started this idea just with the highlights. And then I would try to find my red or my orange or whatever other warm color I have, and then try to make the rest of my apple with that warm color. These apples are kind of weird because they're kind of red apples, but they're also kind of yellowish green apples too. So you have some, you have lots of fun that you can do with these apples because you're going to do something with green and it might be a blue green, it might be a yellow green, uh, or it's going to be a green, but you're going to have at least one green kind of to work with in this composition. Um, the way that we um, choose tetrads, um, you're going to have at least one green, at least one warmish color. It might not be red, it might be a yellow, I mean an orange red or a red violet, but it's going to be some some red to work with. So don't panic. You'll have some kind of red to work with. You'll have some kind of a blue or violet to work with um, for this project. But um, you know, you're only going to have four colors to work with. So it's going to be a somewhat limited palette. I think Cezanne is working with about five or six colors in this painting. So it'll be impossible for us to get exactly the same kind of a feeling that is, is showing in this painting. He's using chunky brush strokes in this painting to get, um, to get some of these effects. We're using a different kind of paint application using a dot application in a pointillist style. So we're doing a different kind of paint application. So it's gonna have a different quality to it when we get done. I'm gonna set this stuff aside for just a second and come back to this concept here. After eight hours of painting, you will have something that has this level of complexity in it, where you have um, you know, predominant areas of your highest key value are going to be in the center, center left of all of your pieces of fruit. And you're going to have kind of a crescent shaped, you know, shadow, you know, on the right hand side of all of your pieces of fruit. You're going to have cast shadows behind your fruit and a somewhat neutralized area of uh, shadow you know, in and among your fruit and a much more neutralized kind of shadow. All of your colors, all four colors are gonna be up here interspersed with each other, but they will tend to neutralize each other out. And if you use your two lower key colors to make this a little bit darker, then you're gonna have this kind of more darkness up here while you have this kind of um, light, this kind of pool of light down here below the, the uh, fruit. And that pool of light, again, it kind of does the same thing. It tends to kick the front of this thing forward towards the viewer because this light tends to advance towards the viewer, whereas this dark and this neutralized color tends to um, recede away from the viewer. And so we start to explore the idea of three-dimensional um, plastic uh, color um, in this composition, just like the plastic colors in this composition. The foreground advances towards the viewer because it is bright. The background tends to recede away from the viewer because it is dark and neutralized. And that tends to open up, oops, open up the compositional space a little bit. And then we have these spherical objects in the middle ground that are also tending to open up the compositional space. The bright highlights are advancing towards the viewer and the shadows are receding away from the viewer. And so this will be fun. It's kind of an experiment to see what we can do. And if we do it with this kind of paint by numbers template, then anybody can do this. You don't have to be a painting student or a drawing student and have those kinds of drawing and painting skills. You will be able to start with this thing, cover it with color, and eventually be able to do this. I wanted to make this available to you now so that you could 
play with this over the weekend, including Monday, which is a holiday, so that we won't be meeting for class on Monday. So I won't see you or talk to you again until next Wednesday. This would give you on and off, you know, four, five, six hours to get this thing established. So I have these two things available for pickup um, outside my door here on the west side of Eden Hall. I've got these blank um, uh, templates that are printed out on cardstock to, for you to paint on. And generally, you know, you can take two of these because you're always going to say, well, I'm going to screw one up and I'll have to start over again. To which I would like to say, in painting, there's no such thing as messing it up. There's no such thing as an eraser in painting. All we do is wait for the paint to dry, and then we paint over the paint with other paint. And the way that painters correct their mistakes is not by trying to erase a mistake. They just paint over a mistake, and they keep painting over and over and over with other layers until they finally get it figured out. And for the, when the painting you know, works visually, that is just the many layers of paint that it took to make that painting actually balance out and work properly. So the templates are going to be available outside my west, west side door on Eden Hall. And this color printout with the instructions and a, a picture on the back of it will be available for you to pick up too. So please pick these up so that you've got this as a visual reference to look at while you're trying to paint this with the four colors that you're going to choose for your Tetrad. So now I'm going to come back to you guys and see if there's any questions. I'm going to change cameras so that you can see my happy smiling face again and see, you know, do you have any questions or comments on this project? I know that it's totally terrible of me to give you guys something to do when there's gonna be a national holiday and no school on Monday. On the other hand, if you're in the dorms and you got nothing to do, you're gonna be really bored. So we're gonna start this project. I see this taking us at least 10 days to complete this project. And so there will be several more demonstrations and discussions for me to kind of um, go over the finer points of this uh, and actually figure out the ways that we can then um, do some final touch-ups on this thing to actually make it pop and to work as a composition. So I will be holding your hands. I'll be helping you through this process and guiding you towards a successful painting in this. But this is the way I wanted to spend a little bit more time and intensity on a painting so that we can really get our feet wet with something that is about uh, using paint and um, using a more sophisticated um, uh, color scheme, a four color color scheme, the color tetrad. So this is our project. This is our assignment for the weekend and the foreseeable future. Anybody have any questions or comments for me at this point? Or you just think I'm wonderful, which you'd be right about that too. Okay. Well, I haven't lost anybody. Uh oh, yes, Mary. I had a question about the tetrads. Yeah. Um, are there ever, um, is it always with a, with a composition, is it always just a single tetrad? And, and um, is there ever one where they like double it? So they have a double tetrad, two different um, oh, yeah. I don't know, palettes going on in the same painting, or does that make it something else? No, 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 no. Painters, when they get into this, they can select as many colors as they want. They can build their palette um, as uniquely as they want. And sometimes the, a painter's palette will have six, seven, eight colors in it. And then the, the nature of the colors can be slightly different because they might like a rose matter as a reddish uh, paint instead of an alizarin crimson. You know, and the, the, when you get into painting and you start selecting colors and that kind of thing um, and creating your own painting style, you know, then you're off on your own thing. This is just a, a, a beginning way for us in a design class to understand a color scheme that's a balanced color scheme that has um, high key and low key colors and warm and cool colors so that we could, this is a very limited palette to try to build a composition out of. 
Um, most painters won't be um, restricting themselves to only four colors, but um, sometimes um, designers do restrict themselves to four colors when they're doing a a poster or something and they only have four colors to work with and they don't even want the colors to mix so um you know it's it's kind of just interesting and since we have to deal with the idea of a uh, a tetrad as a color scheme i wanted to dive in a little bit deeper and explore how a tetrad could work in combination with the idea of plastic color trying to make the bright colors and the warm colors advance and the cool colors and the neutralized colors recede to create the illusion of plastic shapes in a plastic space. So um, uh, a two wordy question to an answer to your question, but um, painters will probably not limit themselves to just four colors when they're creating a painting. Um, but it was a good question and thank you very much for that. And I know nobody else has a question. So I thank you, Mary, for asking me a question because you know, you're an engaged person who's always you know, got things going on and, and ideas. And I appreciate that. I'm gonna leave you guys today. This was 40 minutes of me rambling about you know, getting started with the color Tetrad and the um, still life with apples and trying to do it in the style of Surat with pointillism but I would really like us to do that. I really want to see pointillism done with the wrong end of the paintbrush and to just spend your time kind of building up a surface with dots because it, it's a slow enough process where you can actually get um, a, a better understanding of optical color mixing where we're just putting down pure color onto the composition and then our eyes and our, our uh, you know, physical uh, sense of um, visual perception has to do the, the color mixing in our brain to make the illusion of this start to work for us. So um, the handouts are on the table outside and they'll be out there, you know, well into the evening tonight. And I may just leave them out there and they'll be out there on Saturday too, so that you can pick them up at your convenience. If you can't get them, or if you are way far away remote from Coos Bay and would like me to email you this stuff, I can email you copies of this stuff so that you could print it out on your own computer at home. So that's a possibility too. But otherwise, this is printed out and it's on the table for you to pick up when you can. That's all I got for you today. I'm gonna to get paint on me, so I have to go wash the paint off of this brush because now I've got paint on both ends of this brush. So until next week, um, have a great weekend and a good day off on Monday, and I won't see you again until Wednesday. So uh, until then, uh, happy painting, and we'll see how you're doing when we meet again next Wednesday. Bye-bye.